Hello everyone, welcome back to another video on historical knitting. I've sat down with a nice hot cup of tea and my latest knitting project to keep my hands busy while I get a little chatty with you about how to get started in historical knitting. Just to preface this a little bit, I am not an expert historical knitter. I started knitting historical patterns just about a year ago, and I've been working mainly just from one book from the 1890s. So I don't have any expertise, but I can give some advice and hints on where to get started if you're looking to do some historical knitting from around the mid to late 1800s. I've decided to split the starting points for beginning historical knitting by knitting level. So if you'd like to skip ahead to your particular knitting level, I'll put the timestamps in the description box below. If you've never knit before, or it's been a while since you knit your last row and you still classify yourself a beginning knitter, you can actually get started right away with historical knitting. In fact, I believe that there's a pattern in my 1892 copy of The Art of Knitting that is a perfect first project. For many people, a simple scarf is usually the absolute first project that they ever knit, but there's actually a knit towel pattern in this particular book that I think lends itself also very well to being a first pattern. Unfortunately, I don't think that the original instructions that come with this knitted towel pattern are quite enough for someone who is a beginning knitter or a completely new knitter, so I've decided to translate that pattern and include as many explanations, pictures, and links to videos as I could to allow this to be the first project for anyone who has never knit before, so that your first project can be an antique pattern. The link to the pattern is in the description box below, and I've made it free because I want to make sure that anyone can get started in historical knitting, no matter your knitting level. At the end of the pattern, I've also included three different variations of the towels. They aren't particularly historically accurate, but I wanted to kind of give a progression for people who are completely new to knitting to work through, so that after they're done knitting those three variations, I believe that you'll have all the skills necessary to knit some of the patterns that I'll mention in the intermediate section. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a bridge on how to get from the beginning knitter level for historical knitting to the intermediate level. If you're a knitter who's comfortable working on lace patterns or doing color work and are pretty confident in reading knitting patterns, then I think that you would probably classify yourself as an intermediate knitter when it comes to the advice I would give on where to start with historical knitting. I'm also assuming that at this point you've looked at some historical or antique knitting patterns and just have been a little bit intimidated by the lack of information or the difference of information in the antique patterns versus the patterns that are available today. I would say that this is around the point that I got started on historical knitting and something that I wish that I would have done and I really could give advice to doing if you want to get started on historical knitting is finding an antique pattern that someone has taken the time to translate and comparing the translated pattern with the original antique pattern to start getting a feel for how does an antique pattern get translated into modern knitting terms and how can you work from an antique pattern to create your own version of the pattern that was written then. To give a few examples, there is quite a famous 1890s sweater pattern that is available both in the antique version but also in a modern translation. So a great starting point would be to buy the modern translation pattern but then also reference the original antique pattern to better understand how one was transformed into the other. So this would be a great project if you want to start with maybe knitting a sweater as your first historical project. Now sweaters are quite a big investment of time and might not be the most ideal starting point. Maybe you want something a little bit more digestible first. Also, just to note, I want to be upfront. Some of the patterns that I will be suggesting are actually my own patterns that you have to purchase, and they're the ones that I, I have written up. There are a few others also scattered in that aren't my written up patterns, but I just wanted to make sure that I was upfront and clear about that before I suggested them. For a few other starter projects, if you're comfortable with lace work, then I could maybe recommend working off of my pattern that I created that translated four different types of lace edgings and trims. These are pretty short in width and have very nice repeats to work on, and I find that you can actually get into a really nice rhythm when you're knitting these lace trims. I've included the link below to all the patterns that I've suggested, as well as the original versions of the translations in the description box. As an alternative, if you're comfortable with simple color stripes and some very minor sewing, then I could suggest knitting a woolen underskirt. 
While it looks like a large project, each different chevron is actually a separate panel that can be knit individually, and you can knit as many as you'd like to make the exact size of skirt that you would want. For those of us that want a first historical project that is a great TV knit and are okay with a little bit of crocheting, I can highly recommend the shoulder cape that I just recently finished. It is just plain stockinette, alternating if you're starting with a knit row or a purl row first, and it's fantastic to kind of zone out and watch some TV too. Another pattern that I think is actually really fantastic, and this one is free, is a knitted pence jug. Someone else wrote up these instructions on Ravelry, and what I found was even more fascinating was that they had an entire thought process and discussion of how they came across this pattern and how they decided to translate it when they were writing up the modern instructions, and they also have a really cute set of pictures of the finished result. These are just a few of the translations that exist out there for some antique patterns, and they're mostly from the late 1800s. If you're looking for some other translations, and I can highly recommend searching on either Ravelry or Etsy, although I will say Etsy is typically more of the original patterns rather than the translations. So I'll leave a link down below to get you started on a Ravelry search for some antique knitting patterns if you're looking for some different ones. And of course, I'll be continuing to knit some more historical patterns, so if you continue to follow me, then I'll be releasing more historical patterns that you could potentially work off of as well. Now, once you've worked off of one or more translated historical knitting patterns, you might start wanting to work on some patterns that haven't yet been translated and maybe want to do your own. So I'll talk about how to translate your own antique knitting patterns from the original pattern in the next section. If you have experience knitting from modern patterns and have come across some antique patterns that you really want to translate or interpret yourself, then I'm happy to try to give you some pieces of advice that I've found have been helpful in my own journey. I will also mention that as part of this CocoVid weekend that Miss Philomena will be also releasing a video on how to translate historical knitting patterns to modern terms. So I highly recommend watching her video when it's released. I will link it down below once it's available as well as a link to the schedule so you can watch her video too if you're interested in translating these historical patterns. To start with, I think it's important to talk about where exactly to find historical patterns. I personally find that I most frequently go to archive.org to find antique knitting patterns. It is a fantastic free resource that has a lot of different books on it, and I'll include a link down below to the search terms that I use, though the knitting books are typically from the mid-1800s onwards that you can find there for free. The other site that I've used to find antique original knitting patterns has been Etsy. Some people actually scan in some antique knitting books and you can purchase the PDFs of those scans to work off of. Now, of course, it's not free, unlike archive.org, and sometimes I find that they scan in the pattern but not the page that tells you what the translations are, so what exactly all of the stitch markings mean. But there is some variety on Etsy that just isn't available anywhere else that I could find. I can also recommend Etsy, though it does come with a few caveats. When I find an antique knitting pattern that I want to translate or interpret, I find it important to first establish what all of the different abbreviations or stitch markings mean. Usually at the front of some of the knitting books or knitting patterns, you'll find what the abbreviations mean, although I have found that in some individual patterns, they might stray from this particular abbreviation scheme. Once I know generally what the abbreviations should stand for in a pattern, I will take the time to read through the original pattern a few times. What I'm looking for is to get a general feel of the construction of the item. Will I be knitting it from left to right, top to bottom, bottom to top? Is it knit flat or in the round? How many stitches am I casting off? Does it generally make sense with the stitch counts that it's talking about? And sometimes if we're at the more complicated patterns, I'll actually have a notebook next to me and I'll sketch out exactly what the construction is supposed to look like as I'm working through the pattern and as I'm reading through the pattern, noting where things seem a little bit unclear or I might need to do a few different variations to understand exactly what the pattern is suggesting. I will note that I have found a few errors in the patterns in terms of stitch counts or lace repeats or repeats in general, so that I would say is probably the hardest thing to try to interpret because you do know that it isn't going to work as written, but you do want to interpret what's written as best as possible. If you are interpreting something for the first time, I would highly suggest interpreting something with a picture or a sketch because 
actually find that the sketches, especially that were done of the knitted items, are really detailed. Detailed to the point where I can actually use it as a reference to understand exactly how many stitches should be cast on or if a yarn over was misplaced in a lace pattern, I could figure out where it was supposed to be based on the sketch that accompanied the pattern. Something else to be really aware of is knitting gauge. A lot of historical knitting patterns, especially antique patterns, have no mention of gauge. They'll sometimes mention a needle size and generally a yarn thickness, but no gauge really to understand how large to choose your needle size and yarn size. Before I start a pattern, I'll actually take a few different scrap pieces of yarn that I have in different thicknesses and a few different needle sizes around what is recommended and knit up a few gauge swatches. Then based on the recommended number of stitches to cast on and maybe how wide a pattern is going to get or how narrow a pattern is going to get, I'll then decide on what set of needles and what yarn thickness to use. A quick note on needle sizes. Historically or in antique patterns, needle sizes are different than modern ones. Generally I found that the larger the needle size mentioned there, the thinner the needles, which is opposite to what we have today. I found a few knitting needle size trends translation charts and I'll link them below and those are the ones that I usually use to kind of guide what needle sizes I should be testing around with my gauge. Oftentimes I will try to pick the needle and yarn size that is as close as possible to allow me to cast on the original suggested number of stitches but sometimes the pattern is written for someone who is a size extra small and I am not an extra small so if it means that I have to go up to ridiculously large size yarn or needle in order to keep the original cast on stitch suggestion, I instead will actually scale up the entire yarn and increase the number of stitches to cast on rather than going up to really bulky yarn because typically bulky yarn isn't used in historical knitting patterns. All right, so those are the tips that I have on getting started with historical knitting based off of different knitting levels. If you decide to get started with historical knitting and you would like to share some pictures with me, I would love to see them. Please feel free to send them to me on my Instagram. I can't wait to see what you all work on. I want to say thank you so much for joining me for this chat, and I can't wait to see you again really soon to knit an 1890s Miser's Purse. I'll see you all then. Bye.